and sisters, Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Salim Al-Amri of UAE will deliver a talk on status of Sunnah in Islam. A brief intro of the Sheikh, he is a student of, senior students of Sheikh Nasiruddin Albani. I request Sheikh Salim Al-Amri to start his talk. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Brothers and sisters in Islam The topic for today is the status of sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم And before we start elaborating Upon the status of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we need to know what's the meaning of sunnah first of all. So, the definition of sunnah, sunnah linguistically, lexically, it means way. The sunnah means way from the p- linguistic perspective. So when we say sunnah of Rasul ﷺ, we mean the way of the Prophet ﷺ. But technically, the definition of sunnah as defined by the Muslim scholars, they're saying the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, all his sayings, the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, all his actions, and all his approvals. All his sayings, and all his actions, and approvals. What does this mean? The things the Prophet ﷺ said, that is sunnah, what he said. And what he did also, the things that he practiced, also sunnah. And the things that he approved of, he sanctioned. Things happened in front of him, and he kept quiet. That means... If he kept quiet, the Prophet ﷺ would never keep quiet about something wrong happening in front of him. So if something happened in front of him, and we are going to talk about this, and he kept quiet, that means he approves of it. He sanctions it. Having said this now, that the sunnah, the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, the actions of the Prophet ﷺ, and the approvals of the Prophet ﷺ. So the sunnah, how many types of sunnah we have? We have four types. We have four types of sunnah. The sayings, which we call sunnah qawliya, what the Prophet ﷺ said, like the hadith. You are in Bukhari, Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, the Prophet ﷺ said, these are his sayings. So this is sunnah. But which type of sunnah? Sunnah qawliya, the oral sayings. The oral sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We have sunnah fi'liya, the things that he did. He showed us how to pray. He said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me praying. Take your, learn your rituals of hajj from me. Khudu anni manasikakum. How he performed the hajj. The things that he did in the Hajj, these are actions of the Prophet ﷺ. Are you following me, brothers and sisters? Clear? Now, also we have Sunnah, the approvals of the Prophet ﷺ. The approvals. Something happened in front of him, and he kept quiet. 
Like what? Like, for instance, eating a sort of reptiles, type of reptiles, lizard. It's a, it's a no, one type of lizard. We call it in Arabic, dab. Dab. This reptile or dab was brought to the Prophet Sallallahu and it was roasted and it was put on the table. The Prophet Sallallahu was nearly going to touch it. Then they told him this is dab. So he left it. He didn't eat it. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was sitting. He said immediately, O oh, Prophet of Allah, is it haram? He said, no, but I don't like it. It is not haram, but I don't like it. Khalid said, immediately I dragged it, I pulled it, and I started eating it in front of the Prophet Wasallam. He was watching me while I was eating it. So this, that he approved eating of dab, though he doesn't like it personally. Are you following me? So he approved of something. So if he approved of something, وسلم, it means it is halal. Because it is impossible that the Prophet will approve of something haram. The fourth type of sunnah, which many Muslims don't understand this, is what is called Sunnah Tarkiya. Sunnah Tarkiya, which means the things that he abandoned, the things that he didn't do. So things that he didn't do, in spite of the need, the need was there, and he did not do, this means the Sunnah that he don't do it. Like what? By examples, things becomes clearer. You know the Prophet Wasallam. he made adhan for the salah. We have adhan for the salah. But there are some prayers, no adhan. Eid prayer. Is there adhan in Eid prayer? He didn't make adhan for the Eid prayer. So he leave, he left the adhan for the Eid prayer. So the sunnah now is not to make adhan for the Eid, right? He left the adhan, so we have to leave the adhan. He left the adhan for the eclipse prayer. When there is an eclipse, whether it is lunar or solar eclipse, there is no prayer. There is no adhan. So the sunnah that you should not make adhan. If one now comes and says, we'll make adhan for the Eid, we will say it is bid'ah. We'll say what? It is bid'ah because the Prophet ﷺ, he left the adhan for the Eid and for the eclipse prayer. Are you following me? Is this clear? So the things that the Prophet ﷺ did not do in spite of the need, the need is there to inform the people, to tell them come to the masjid, he didn't make adhan. So we know that the things that he didn't do, it is sunnah that also we should do the same thing. And this type of sunnah, we call it sunnah tarkiyah, or tarki sunnah, or abandoning sunnah. That whatever the Prophet ﷺ forsook, whatever the Prophet ﷺ abandoned, we should not do. It is sunnah that you abstain from it and you don't do it. So how many types do we have? Four types. Now, that is the sunnah, the meaning of sunnah and types of sunnah. A status of sunnah. The sunnah is wahi. The sunnah is revelation from Allah. We have to bear this in mind. Allah said, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Whatever the Prophet ﷺ does not speak out of his own hawa, out of his own desire. In huwa illa wahyun yuha, he follows what has been inspired and revealed to him. And the Sahaba at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they used to write whatever he says. And one day, one of the companions said to another one who, to a scribe who was writing, don't write everything the Prophet ﷺ said. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? Re write. 
right by him in whose hand my soul is, nothing comes out of this except the truth. So the sunnah is a revelation from Allah. And Allah protected the sunnah as he protected the Quran. Because he said, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ And it is beyond any doubt that the dhikr covers both Quran and Sunnah. Though, though, many people tried to fabricate and forge and concoct false hadith and attribute it to the Prophet ﷺ. But Allah protected the deen. How Allah protected the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? By something only the Muslims have it, which is the Isnad. The chain of narrators. That's why this ummah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is known as the ummah of Isnad. Ummah of Isnad, which is a continuous and broken chain of reliable narrators, starting by the muhaddith and ends with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And you, MashaAllah, in India, you have many scholars of hadith who have isnads to the Prophet He will tell you, so and so told me, so and so told me, till he reaches the Prophet This is the unbroken chain of narrators, isnad. No ummah, no nation on the face of the globe has this except the Muslims. Ask the Christians, can any bishop or the Pope himself. The Pope himself, can he narrate and gives us unbroken chain till he reaches Jesus Christ? He doesn't have that. Ask any rabbi, any Jewish scholar, can you give me unbroken chain till you reach Musa alayhi salam? No. Ask the Muslims, yes. So this is how Allah preserved the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, by the isnad. So many people, they were idiot fools, they fabricated a hadith, and they attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. Immediately the scholars of hadith found out, where is the isnad? Oh, in this isnad, so and so is a big liar. So the hadith is crossed out. So this science of hadith is amazing science. Every narrator, we have his own biography. We have something known as ilm al-jarh wa ta'deel, or the science of crediting and discrediting the narrators. Every narrator, we know his biography, when he was born, the year he was died, everything about him. So when we study the isnad, we go through every narrator. We scrutinize and check thoroughly every narrator. That's Allah protected the sunnah. And the scholars of hadith, they have classified those fabricated a hadith. They, sought, they sifted the sunnah and said those are hadith are not true. And they put them in special books. And in our time, our Shaykh Albani rahimahullah was the leading authority in this area, he checked all the books of the sunnah. And he said, this hadith is authentic, this hadith is not authentic. Make it easy for everyone. Scholars who spend their lifetime to serve and protect the sunnah of the Prophet So the sunnah is protected. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, وَمَا آتَاكُمَ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا this, obliga this obligation, Allah is saying, whatever the Prophet ﷺ gives you, take it. Whatever he says, take it. And whatever he forbids you, abstain from it. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. He said, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ in Surah number 3, Ali Imran. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمُ اللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Say, if you claim, and if you say that you love Allah, then follow me, Allah will love you. You follow the Prophet 
then Allah will love you. And Allah will forgive you your sins. Allah, verily Allah, is most uh, often forgiven, often most merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it clear that you follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if you love Allah, then Allah will love you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it obligatory upon us to follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the sunnah, brothers and sisters, without the sunnah, we will not know the deen. Without the sunnah, we will not be able to understand Islam. Imagine there is no sunnah. We will not be able to pray. We will not be able to give zakah, etc. That's why the sunnah explains this book. It explains the Quran. The sunnah explains the Quran. So the relationship, relationship between sunnah and Quran, there is a direct relationship between sunnah and Quran. Either you will find that the sunnah, as with the scholars of usul, they say, a sunnah, details the summarized in Arabic as sunnah to bayin al mujmal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he summarized he gave general statement a command he said wa aqimu salah establish the salah how can anyone teach me the salah from the Quran that's why those who call themselves Qur'ani, you have them here in the India? Qur'ani Yun, they say, all the Qur'an. So ask him, teach me Salah from the Qur'an. How many rak'ahs? This is the Qur'an, go and teach me. The Qur'an said, establish the Salah. Aqeemu Salah. It is the Sunnah that explained that word, Aqeemu Salah. It is summarized. No details. So it is the sunnah now, the role of the sunnah to detail this summarized text. So the sunnah details and explains thoroughly and in great depth that command. Establish the prayers. Are you following me? So the sunnah details the summarized. To bayin explains al-mujmal. So that is one aspect that shows the relationship between Quran and Sunnah. And by the way, brothers and sisters, there will never be any contradiction between Quran and Sunnah. If there is a contradiction, it is only here in your mind. But in reality, there is no contradiction. You will never find a contradiction between the Quran and the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Simply because both of them from Allah. Then... It is irrational that there will be conflict or contradiction. If you think there is a contradiction, it is either your understanding is wrong or the hadith is not authentic. The hadith is not authentic. That's why it makes this conflict. But if the hadith is authentic, there will never, there will be harmony between the Quran and the Sunnah. Right? Now, so the Sunnah... Because you find some people, they will say, if we find, only we follow what is in the Qur'an. Say, no, 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 no. You follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Because you have been commanded by Allah to follow the Qur'an and Sunnah. A woman came to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, the woman, a woman who blocks her eyebrows is cursed in the book of Allah. You know, blocking eyebrows. A woman came, he said, Ibn Mas'ud, what are you saying? I have read the Qur'an from the cover to the cover. Where is it? Show it to me. He said, Ibn Mas'ud is a faqih. Ibn Mas'ud is one of the fuqaha, of the jurists of the sahaba. 
And but Ibn Mas'ud, he left Medina earlier. So many of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't hear of. You know, in the early days of da'wah, I have to stand now. In the beginning of Islam, Muslims used to pray, putting their hands between their knees in the ruku'ah. Understand this? That was in the beginning. And then this practice was abrogated. Was abrogated, cancelled. Ibn Mas'ud, he didn't know about this. So he didn't know about the abrogation. So that knowledge didn't reach him. So he carried on praying as he was praying before. So that cannot be used against Ibn Mas'ud. Cannot be used because he didn't know. And the hadith didn't reach him. And in those days, you know the hadith, to reach someone, the distance you have to cover and travel. That's why many times Abu Huraira used to sit with the Prophet ﷺ all the time. So he memorized many ahadith. So later on when he was narrating the ahadith, some of the sahaba like Umar ibn Khattab said, did the Prophet ﷺ say that? He said, yes, Umar, but you were busy. Huh? I was next to his knee to the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, he said that. And I'll give this example. That you know, Umar ibn Khattab was heading to Syria. Then he heard about the break of the disease, the plague. Then he asked the Sahaba, what do you think? The Sahaba divided into two groups. One saying, yes, we'll go. Some others say, no, no, no. This disease is very uh, contagious, very d uh, dangerous, fatal. And Umar decided not to go. Only one, hundreds of the Sahaba, including Umar ibn Khattab, they did not hear the hadith about the plague. Imagine. So if someone asks you, is it possible that the Imam didn't know about this hadith? Tell him, yes, it is possible. Hundreds of the Sahaba, including Umar ibn Khattab, they did not hear about the hadith of the plague. Only one of them, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, he heard it. And he came, he went to respond to the call of nature. And he came back and he found the army on the move. He said, what happened? They told him. He said, I heard the Prophet ﷺ saying, if you hear of the plague in the town, and you are inside that town, don't leave that town. And if you are outside, don't enter. Umar said, Alhamdulillah. Muhammad, peace be Pearls of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Abu Sayyid Al Khudri, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that he heard the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, Whoever amongst you notices something evil should correct it with his own hands, and if he is unable to do so, should prohibit the same with his tongue. If he is unable even to do this, he should at least consider it as bad in his heart. This is the lowest degree of faith. Sahih Muslim, Volume 1, Kitabul Iman, Book of Faith, Chapter 21, Hadith Number 79. Pearls of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Abdullah ibn Amr. May Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, A Muslim is the one who avoids harming Muslims with his tongue and hands, and a Muhajir is the one who gives up all what Allah has forbidden. Sahih al-Bukhari, Volume 1, Kitabul iman Book of Faith, Chapter 4, Hadith Number 15. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, the woman, a woman who blocks her eyebrows is cursed in the book of Allah. You know, blocking eyebrows. A woman came, he said, Ibn Mas'ud, what are you saying? I have read the Quran from the cover to the cover. Where is it? Show it to me. He said, Ibn Mas'ud is a faqih. Ibn Mas'ud is one of the fuqaha, of the jurists of the sahaba. And but Ibn Mas'ud, he left Medina earlier. 
So many of the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam he didn't hear of. You know, in the early days of da'wah, I have to stand now. In the beginning of Islam, Muslims used to pray, putting their hands between their knees in the ruku'ah. You understand this? That was in the beginning. And then this practice was abrogated. Was abrogated, cancelled. Ibn Mas'ud, he didn't know about this. So he didn't know about the abrogation. So that knowledge didn't reach him. So he carried on praying as he was praying before. So that cannot be used against Ibn Mas'ud. Cannot be used because he didn't know. And the hadith didn't reach him. And in those days, you know the hadith, to reach someone, the distance you have to cover and travel. That's why many times Abu Huraira used to sit with the Prophet all the time. So he memorized many a hadith. So later on when he was narrating the hadith, some of the Sahaba like Umar ibn Khattab, he said, did the Prophet said that? He said, yes, Umar, but you were busy. Huh? I was next to his knee to the Prophet Yes, he said that. And I'll give this example. That you know, Umar ibn Khattab was heading to Syria. Then he heard about the break of the disease, the plague. Then he asked the Sahaba, what do you think? The Sahaba divided into two groups. One saying, yes, we'll go. Some others say, no, no, no. This disease is very uh, contagious, very d- uh, dangerous, fatal. And Umar decided not to go. Only one, hundreds of the Sahaba, including Umar ibn Khattab, they did not hear the hadith about the plague. Imagine. So if someone asks you, is it possible that the Imam didn't know about this hadith? Tell him, yes, it is possible. Hundreds of the Sahaba, including Umar ibn Khattab, they did not hear about the hadith of the plague. Only one of them, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he heard it. And he came, he went to respond to the call of nature, and he came back and he found the army on the move. He said, what happened? They told him. He said, I heard the Prophet ﷺ saying, if you hear of the plague in the town, and you are inside that town, don't leave that town. And if you are outside, don't enter. Umar said, Alhamdulillah. Okay? So Ibn Mas'ud, he didn't hear of that, the hadith that this is abrogated. So we cannot use that against Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud is an imam, a jurist, faqih. So this woman said, oh Ibn Mas'ud, I read the Quran. He said, had you read the Quran, you would have found it. But you didn't read the Quran with care. Didn't you read what Allah said? وَمَا آتَاكُمَ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Didn't you read that Allah said, whatever the Prophet ﷺ gives you, take it, and whatever he forbids you, abstain from it? Didn't you come across that ayah? He said, yes. He said, what are you talking then? He is the one who said a woman should not block her eyebrows. And Allah is saying, if he tells you don't block, you don't block. That is what the Quran is saying. Then this woman, she wanted to make Ibn Mas'ud angry. You know what she said? But your wife is doing it. Imagine, she wanted to provoke Ibn Mas'ud. He said, oh Ibn Mas'ud, your wife is blacking her eyebrows. So why are you blaming us? You know what he said? He said, go and check. She went inside and came, said, sorry, she is not doing it. Then he told her, do you think... She would have stayed with me if she was doing that. I would have divorced her immediately. She wouldn't have remained with me. That's what Ibn Mas'ud said. So the Sunnah, it explains the Quran. There will never be any contradiction between Sunnah and Quran. So either it details, this is one aspect we mentioned, it details the summarized. Second thing, it specifies the general, which means to khassis al-am. To khassis al-am. There is a general text, general statement, 
generic command. Allah said. Then the sunnah comes and makes exception. Making exceptions is known as takhsis. You specify, you exclude, you exempt. Like what? Are you following me first of all? Good. I want now, we have two containers. This container and this container. In one container we write dead animals. Dead animals. In the other container we write blood. Blood. Any blood put it in the container of the blood. Any dead animal in the container of the dead animals. Okay? Now, dead sheep in the container. Dead goat in the container. Dead cow in the container. Dead camel in the container. The fish in the market. Dead or alive? Dead. Where should we put it? In the container. It's dead. So those who are saying, only we follow the Qur'an, we tell them, according to your understanding, according to the Qur'an, you should not eat fish. Because fish is haram. Because the Qur'an in Surah Al-Maidah, Surah number 5 is saying, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمِ الْمَيْتَةِ Any dead animal is haram. And you only follow the Qur'an. And the fish in the market is dead. So you should not eat it. You understand? You should not eat it. Because the Qur'an is saying it is haram. Because you don't accept the sunnah. Anything blood, put it in the container of the blood. It's haram. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمِ الْمَيْتَةِ Dead animals are made unlawful, haram. dam blood. Now, the liver, you know the liver? Is it blood or flesh? Blood. Put it inside. Spleen. Blood, put it inside. So the liver is haram. It is blood and the spleen. But the sunnah say, came and said, no. There are exceptions. From this container, two components will come out. Two elements will remove them. The fish and locust. You know locust? Jarat. The locust. It is an insect that flies, you know. It is halal. And come in swarms, and they eat the grass, and they eat everything. Okay, so the Prophet ﷺ said, though the locust is, is dead, but it is halal. The fish, it is dead, but it is halal. Exception. So who, what made the exceptions here? The sunnah. The ayah says, the dead animals, general. What specifies it? What limited its generality? It's the sunnah. Said, no, 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 here, there is an exception. What is ex uh, exempted? The fish and the locust. The blood. The sunnah came and said, no. The liver is halal. Though it is blood, exempted. The spleen is blood. It is exempted. So you can see now the sunnah specifies what? The general. That is, second aspect. The relationship between Quran and, and sunnah. The third aspect, that the sunnah limited the absolute. In Arabic, a sunnah to qayyid al-mutlaq. A sunnah to qayyid al-mutlaq, the sunnah limits the absolute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, regarding the thief, وَالسَّارِقُ وَالسَّارِقَةُ فَاقْطَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَا The thieves, both male and female, cut off their hands. In the Arabic language, the hand, this word hand has many meanings. It can, from here. Or this is one hand. Or from the elbow until the end, from here. It is hand. Or from the wrist till the tips of the finger. This is hand. So the Quran said you cut off the hand. Where should I cut? If you don't accept the sunnah, then you will say, Any, anywhere you can cut, anywhere. You cut anywhere. You understand? So it is the sunnah said, no, 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 no. 
This absoluteness has to be limited. It is limited. So the sunnah came and said, no, 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 no. The hand has to be cut only from the wrist. In the absence of the sunnah, you will not be able from where to cut. Are you following me? Good. The sunnah also brings sometimes, this is I think the fourth aspect, that it, it says the same thing that is in the Quran. Yes, so it affirms, it affirms whatever already start, uh, established in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made alcohol haram, the sunnah said also khamr is haram. It is just assuring, affirming, giving the same. The fifth aspect, the sunnah brings rulings that are not in the Quran. New rulings. And new rulings that they don't exist in the Quran. Now, can we eat the flesh of donkeys? Domestic donkeys? Eating the flesh of domestic donkeys. Halal or haram? Haram? Where? In the Quran? Show me in the Quran that eating the flesh of the donkey is haram. It's not in the Quran. It is where? It's in the Sunnah. It is in the Sunnah. The dom eating the flesh of domestic donkeys is haram. How about the zebras, wild donkeys? Zebras, halal. The zebras are halal. This is donkey and that is donkey. Zebra is halal and it was hunted at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and they ate it. And the domestic donkey is haram. That is in the sunnah. Now, can one marry the maternal or paternal aunt of his wife? Can you marry the aunt of your wife? While, you ha while having your wife? So your wife and her aunt, both of them are your wives. Is that allowed in Islam? No. It is haram. So where is it mentioned in the Quran? Is it in the Quran? It's in the Sunnah. New rulings, not in the Quran, but in the Sunnah. So the Sunnah is revelation. So this is the relationship between Sunnah and Quran. Either the Sunnah explains or details what has been summarized, or it specifies and makes exceptions for the general text, or it limited the absolute. It limited that, it said only cutting the hand from the rest, or it brings new rulings. But they are not there in the, in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the sunnah. So, the status of the sunnah with the Quran, that the sunnah explains the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you cannot get rid of the sunnah, and you cannot say sunnah is something, you know, secondary. Second in the sense, it is not essential. It is very, very essential. Now, if you come across two hadith, both of them are sahih, authentic, both of them in Muslim or in Bukhari, and there is a conflict. I will give an example. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In one hadith he says, whoever touches his private parts should renew his wudu. If you touch your private parts after taking wudu, go and renew the wudu. And this is known as hadith of Busra. There's another hadith which is authentic as well. Hadith Tark, uh, Talq ibn Ali says, 
he was asked about a person touching his private part, he said, it is part of you. Touching a private part, that private part is part of you. Integral part of you. So it doesn't re break your wudu. So one hadith says it breaks, the other hadith says it doesn't break. Well, what to do now? It seems that there is a contradiction. But in reality there is no contradiction. The scholars they said, of course you'll come across opi different opinions of scholars. You find some scholars they say, the hadith of Busra is stronger than the hadith of Palk. So they are giving the fatwa, if someone touches his private part, he has to renew the wudu. Because this hadith to them is stronger than the hadith of Palk. Or some of the scholars said, hadith Talq is abrogated. Abrogated, mansukh. It was before, then it was cancelled by the other hadith. In the beginning, it was permissible to touch the private parts, then it was abrogated. Like before, it was permissible to pray towards Jerusalem, Beit al Maqdis, then it was abrogated. Now, if any Muslim wants to pray towards Jerusalem, his salah is batila. So they said, Hadith of Busra abrogated the Hadith of Talq. But the claim of the issue, claiming abrogation, anyone says this abrogated, he has to produce the date. Say, where is the date that this Hadith was said on this year, and this Hadith in this year, so we know now that this was, the abrogator came after it. And none of the Muslim scholars managed or succeeded in producing the date. So the claim is rejected. Because you cannot accept your claim until you prove that this hadith was said after this hadith. So then we say it is abrogated. So what to do now? The scholar, they say there is no contradiction. The two hadiths are talking about different applications. Different applications. The hadith that says if you touch your private parts, you have to take wudu, if you touch your private part for shahwa, seeking desire and lust, like masturbation. Someone touch his private part, seeking desire. Such a person, in that case, has to renew his, his wudu. The other hadith talks about a person touch his private part accidentally, by accident. Now we are taking a shower, and now you are using the towel. By accident, you touch your private part. So it says, if you touch the private part and it happened accidentally, then there is no need for you to renew your wudu. Or, if there is a need, imagine a man who is handicapped. He cannot move. And his wife is giving him the wudu. Are you following me? If we say that if you touch the private part, touching the private part, breaks the wudu, then she has also to take wudu every time. Because by touching the private part of her husband, giving him the wudu, she also loses her wudu. How about changing the nabis, the divers? Asking the mothers every time they change the divers and the nabis to also? No. So the two hadiths are talking about different cases. If you touch your private part seeking desire, you have to renew it. If you touch it by accident, then it's fine. So there's no contradiction. Imam Ibn Khuzayma is one of the scholars of hadith. He said, I challenge anyone bringing to me two hadith authentic a hadith that they, they have an apparent contradiction or conflict and I will not solve it or resolve it. And the scholars, they mention more than 100 way of resolving the apparent conflict between the authentic narrations. So there will never be conflict or contradictions. So if you come across something like this, you need to refer to the books and you see that the scholars already resolved this conflict. Which you think it is there, 
but the reality it doesn't exist. Now, the Prophet وسلم, he said, do not look to the thigh of a human being, whether he is dead or alive. The thigh, you know the thigh. So the thigh of a human being, man, a woman, the whole body is aura. But the thigh of a, a man is aura. The thigh of a man is aura. So you should not look to the thigh of a man. And in another hadith, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this hadith, he said it to Ali. The other hadith, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to one of the Sahaba, his name was Jarhad. He said, Ya Jarhad, غطي فخذك فإن الفخذ عورة. Oh Jarhad, cover your thigh, because the thigh is aura. Thigh is a nakedness. So now, you find many Muslims, they walk around wearing shorts, right? That is not allowed. Or the football, football players. And you, many times, you, some brothers, they argue. You tell him, but you are watching the thighs of the people, of the players. Say, no, 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 I don't see the thighs, I see only the ball. I'm only focusing on the football itself. Huh? Because they are addicts. Anyway. So these are two authentic ahadith the Prophet ﷺ is saying. The fakhid thigh is awrah. So which type of sunnah is this? Sunnah of actions or saying? Saying. Now, take another hadith. The Prophet ﷺ, one day he was sitting in his house. And Abu Bakr Siddiq entered upon the Prophet ﷺ. And the izar rolled up. And his thigh was shown. And he remained, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in that position. And then Umar ibn Khattab came. And he remained, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the same position. Then Uthman ibn Affan entered. And then the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, covered his thigh. And he said, shouldn't I feel shy of a man that the angels will shy of? Now, he told us, the thigh is aura. And now here, his thigh was shown. In such a case, when you find two narrations, and there is an apparent conflict between them. And one narration is an action, and the other narration is a saying. Which man dominates the other? The saying or the action? The saying. The saying has more power over the action. Why? The saying of the Prophet ﷺ is general for all the Muslims. And sometimes some of his actions are peculiar, special for him only. And the Prophet ﷺ has many things special for him. No one can share. No one can ma marry more than four. Can one? You cannot. So the Prophet ﷺ has things special for him. The sunnah, observing the sunnah becomes fard. Whatever the Prophet ﷺ was practicing, he cannot leave. But you, you can pray the sunnah, you can leave it. But the Prophet ﷺ cannot do that. So, when I come across two narrations, and it looks to me that there is a contradiction, I follow the saying. And the action can be explained. Either it is something special, or it happened out of necessity, or he was unaware of it. He was unaware that his thigh was shown, and it coincided that when Uthman entered, he realized. So he said what he said. Take another example. So I cannot cancel his explicit statements, clearly stating that the thigh is aura. Because of his action. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, you should not drink while standing. In many a hadith, he said, you should not drink while standing. And he said, Man shariba qa'iman If you drink water while standing, 
Put your finger and throw it out. Vomit it out. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu said. And you know it is so painful to vomit, right? So he says if you drink while standing, throw it out. In another hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw a man drinking while standing. He said, Do you like the, the cat to drink with you? Do you prefer the cat to share you your drink? He said, No. He said, The one who is sharing your drink is worse than the cat. Who is it? Who is drinking with you? The shaitan. So if you drink standing, the shaitan drinks with you. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. So this is his saying. Are you following me now? But also we read in another hadith that Ali radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet Sallallahu came one day and there was, you know, skin bag, skin bag, uh, hang on the tree, hung on the tree. So the Prophet Sallallahu drank while standing. While standing. As a rule of thumb, what to do? Following the saying or the action? The saying. I drink sitting. But the scholar they said, the Prophet ﷺ, he drank standing. Either to tell us that it is not haram drinking standing, but it is better to sit down. So the scholars they say, it is makruh. Because he drank standing, so they say the ruling now is not haram, it is makruh. It is not preferable. It is better that you sit down when you drink. Or, the Prophet ﷺ, he did this out of necessity. The skin bag is there on the tree, no glass, nothing. Like sometimes you come to the, the cooler, there is no glass. And you are thirsty, what to do? You will drink while standing. So there was a necessity. And you know something that many Muslims, they tell you, Zamzam, you're drinking to standing, right? And they say to Sunnah to drink Zamzam while standing. We tell them, who told you to Sunnah to drink Zamzam standing? Where is it mentioned? They said the Prophet ﷺ drank Zamzam while standing. They say, yes, but why did he drink Zamzam while standing? Did you know? He was on top of his she-camel. The Prophet ﷺ, he performed the tawaf while riding the camel. The camel is going around the Kaaba. So then he came to Zamzam. And he wanted to come down and hoist the bucket from the well. But if he did that, all the people will jump to do the same thing. So he waited on the top of his camel, and they gave him the bucket of water, and he drank. That is what happened exactly. So it is not sunnah that you, when you want to drink zamzam, while you are sitting here, you stand up. No. Remain sitting, and drink zamzam. Only when you want to drink zamzam, check your niya, make your niya good. Because zamzam, for whatever intention you have, you know this? Zamzam lima shuri balah. But this needs ikhlas. Zamzam lima shuri balah. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Zamzam ta'amu tu'min wa shifa'un min suqum. Zamzam itself is a nutrition, food. And it is a cure. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari said, I lived on Zamzam 40 days and I put on weight. I became fat. Only drinking Zamzam. Only drinking Zamzam. And I mentioned to you the story of the Tunisian sister that she had breast cancer and she was living in France and the doctor decided to amputate the breast. He refused. She went to Mecca, performed Umrah, stayed in the Haram, making Tawaf, drinking Zamzam, washing herself with Zamzam. After a few days, the growth disappeared completely. They went to France, made the checks negative. That is Zamzam. So Zamzam is a blessed water. And it was a miracle as you know. So 
if I come across two hadiths, one is the saying, one is in the actions of the Prophet Wasallam. the saying is for all the Muslims. And then that is either something peculiar, something special for the Prophet Wasallam. Like the Prophet Wasallam, he prayed after Asr. Nafil, Nafil, after Asr. Sunnah. Can we pray Sunnah after Asr? But the Prophet Wasallam did. That is something special for him. Special for the Prophet Wasallam. Not for us. And there are many examples. And we we'll stop at this point. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten our hearts with the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us follow his footsteps till we meet him, inshaAllah, on the fountain. Amin, amin, amin. Barakallah feekum. Izaakum Allah khairi gaza. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan, brother. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we have got 10 minutes for any questions to be asked to the speaker. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. I would like to know the difference between Hadith Qudsi and uh, Sunnat Khawli. Ah. Salam. Assalamu alaikum. The difference between Hadith Qudsi and Hadith Nabawi. See, they call it Hadith Nabawi, Hadith Qudsi. Prophetic tradition and sacred tradition. The Hadith Qudsi, if you want to know about it, it is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allah says. You see the read is not. Abdullah ibn Umar, qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, qala Allah. Abdullah ibn Umar is saying, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah said. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is attributing now this to Allah. He said, Allah said this. What does it mean? It means here the scholars said that the meaning, the content, the meaning of the hadith, that meaning is from Allah Azza wa Jal, the meaning. And the phrasings or the wordings from the Prophet ﷺ. The meaning from Allah and the phrasing or the wordings from the Prophet ﷺ. That is Hadith Qudsi, attributed to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ would say, Allah said. So the meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conveyed it to his Prophet and the wordings. Because how he receives the meaning? It's something he felt it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for instance, he says in the hadith, Inna ruh al-Qudus, verily, the archangel, breathe into my heart, he breathed into my heart, that no soul will die before its appointed time. And the other hadith, it's both the wordings from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the meaning from him, that means things that he understood from the book of Allah, and it is sanctioned by Allah Azza wa Jal. Is this clear to your brother? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My question is that uh, what Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't do, but allow companion to do, like the example you gave the reptile animal, a go we call in India, he didn't like, but prof, uh, the companion ate and he didn't forbid. Even I like that, but Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't like, he didn't eat. But the allowed to Sahaba, will it come in Sawab or Bidat? Because he didn't like, I like and I can't eat because I am not eating because he didn't, didn't eat. When, when Khalid ibn al Walid at it, did the Prophet sallam comment? What does it mean? Halal. It's halal, but Prophet sallam didn't eat. That's what I'm saying. The Sunnah of the Prophet sallam also two types: Sunnah Taada and Sunnah Ibadah. See, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, two types. Sunnah of habit. Things that he didn't do, according, that is his, his norm, natural, his nature. For instance, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loves the sweet. Can we say now, loving sweet is sunnah? And someone, mashallah, he loves the sunnah and he's diabetic. And we tell him the sweet, loving the sweet is sunnah. So he goes and eats the sweet and the sugar goes like that and the vein pops up in his mind. And he enters into coma. Understand? So the Prophet Sallallahu he loves the sweet. He is telling us about his own nature. The Prophet Sallallahu loves pumpkin. You know the pumpkin? Can we say now, eating pumpkin is sunnah? No. It is sunnah, what we call sunnah ta'ada. That was the norm, the way of the people. The Prophet Sallallahu had long hair. Can we say now growing long hair is sunnah? No, it's not sunnah. That was how the Arabs used to grow their hair. And the Prophet ﷺ, he doesn't want to stand out 
do something different from his community. So he grow hair like the people. But if I grow my hair because I love the Prophet Sallallahu and I wait, want to, to make him my example, from that perspective, I will be rewarded. Not because it growing hair in itself is sunnah. Are you following me? Okay? So, the Prophet ﷺ just he didn't like it. That's it. That's it. When we hear Prophet's name, we Muslims used to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But uh, when we take uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Salama, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a zikr, will it be a sunnah? Say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as zikr. Zikr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu salluna ala nabi. Ya ayuhu alladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallim wa taslima. Or you believe Allah showers mercy upon his prophet and mentions him in the upper assembly. So also you invoke Allah's blessings upon his prophet. And when the prophet, the sahaba asked, How, O prophet of Allah, we can make salah upon you? He told them, and he said, Say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alameen innaka hamidun majid. That is ibadah, that is dhikr. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever says the salah ten times in the morning and ten times in the evening, he will get my shafa'a. My shafa'a will be granted to him. Uh, what is the punishment for uh, disobeying the Prophet? That is, uh, some people don't read the Sunnat Namaz also. They just read Faraz and go out of the mosque. I just want to know what is the punishment for disobeying the Sunnah? Such a person who doesn't pray the Sunnah, he is a great loser. He is losing. Don't you know, brothers and sisters, that the first thing on the day of resurrection you will be asked about is your salah. And no one among us can say my salah is 100%. Can anyone say that? You know something, we do our shopping in the salah, right? We start shopping in the salah. Allahu Akbar. And all of a sudden we are inside the mall. Shopping mall. Imam is saying, Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullah, Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullah. We are still in the mall. Right? You say, Allahu Akbar. The shaitan start to bring you the list of the items that your wife wants. Only in the salah. Only in the salah. In the salah. All the list. Oh, she wants this, she wants that. In the salah. That's why they said, a man came to him, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and said, Oh, Imam, there is, I have an item, valuable one, I lost it. I don't know, I kept it somewhere, I don't know. He said, I don't know where you kept it, but I will tell you something. You get up tonight and pray with concentration, and inshallah, you will find it. He started praying at night, and the shaitan came to him and said, You know, you know the item where? There. He reminded him in the salah. The second day he came to the Imam, he said, Yisakullah, hey, Imam. He said, the Imam, did you complete your salah? Did you finish it or you stopped? You understand? And that is exactly the Prophet Sallallahu said, there is a special shaitan for the salah. Special shaitan. His name is Khinzib. The name of this special shaitan, Khinzib. The moment you say, Allahu Akbar, he sits on your shoulder. And he reminds you. That's his job. So now, no one can say that my salah is 100%. So in front of Allah, what should you say? Allah says, how is his salah? Oh Allah, mm, it is 20%. 80% missing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, does he have nafil salah? So we can complete the deficiency? They say yes. Okay, so bring here. But if you don't have any nafil salah, how to complete that? So that's why I say he's a, he's a big loser, great loser. It's not time for salah. Barakallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum.